Hey, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. So today is a special holiday episode on grieving through the holidays. And I wanted to make this episode for you because I think that this is something that we just aren't talking about enough. And it's so big. It's so big to recognize that this holiday time is a time when our grief can be, can feel like an even heavier burden than it does on an ordinary day. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. But I think one of the biggest reasons is because there's all this pressure around the holidays to like be joyous and be merry. And, you know, it's supposed to be this like celebratory, fun, connective time or so the, you know, kind of colonial model tells us that we're supposed to be like really, you know, shopping and preparing for this big important day that is Christmas where we give each other all this stuff and it's supposed to be joyous, right? And um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about more about that model of colonization and um, how it actually really goes against the rhythm, the natural rhythm of the body and the psyche at this time of year. Um, but I want to I want to just make a couple of announcements before we get too far. And the first one is that uh, we will be offering in just a couple of days on December 21st, a two hour long winter solstice ritual, uh, releasing ritual online. And we're doing this as a part of our Through the Dark Woods membership community, but we are opening it up to the, the our larger community. And so you are If you're listening to this, you are invited to join us. And uh, the intention is really honoring that at this time of winter solstice and the holiday season, the energies of the earth are actually really inviting us into a time of inward reflection, dreaming, and this last release downward, you know, towards the earth, towards the soil, towards this like composting time, right? All the leaves of the trees are, are, are not just fallen at this point, but they're actually starting to compost and be digested by, by the earth and the, the creatures that live in the soil are, and, and be, it's becoming earth, you know, it's becoming this rich loamy compost. Our psyches follow these cycles of nature. And so it's this very natural time to actually turn inward and be kind of composting and letting go of patterns and ways of, you know, being ways, you know, habits, um, things that aren't serving us anymore. And it's, it's really potent time to release in order to make space for what is coming in the, in the spring, you know, in the new year. And so this ritual is a really powerful way of connecting your actions to your inner desires and intention, creating physical action and to connect and to, yeah, make an offering to our inner desire and our, our, our intention. And so as you go through the steps and the practice that I'm going to be offering you to do as the ritual, you're actually holding this intention and space for the transformation that you're desiring to experience, for the letting go that you're ready to experience. And it's really powerful to be, to be doing that and to be witnessed in community. And uh, so, yeah, I want to invite you to that. Um, the cost is $37 and uh, so that's email is info at darkwoodsofgrief.com. And um, yeah, I would love to see you there. So there's that. And then also in January, we're going to be offering, we're going to be opening up the group again in mid-January at the membership community. And um, we're going to be offering two intro sessions uh, to the group for you to come in and and really start to understand more about the perspective that I hold and that we hold as a community on grief and grieving and um, some, and learn some of the somatic based skills that uh, we use in the group and feel into if it's a right fit for you to be held in this type of, of community. Yeah. A lot of, a lot happens in that, that community that is very, very generative, very beautiful, very uh, powerful healing and transformation and it's not, it's not a getting rid of our grief, right? It's not a getting through it or getting past it or getting over it. It's not that. It's that when we can come into community and actually really be together in our grieving, there's this, 
you know, similar to what I was talking about with the solstice time, it's like, there's this, this kind of natural transformation, this natural like composting of the energy that happens that then starts to actually bear fruit. There is something that happens when we work with our grief in this way, in these ways that I, that I teach and that we teach in these, these groups, in this community, there's something that happens where the grief is like compost. It is like food. It is like a, a, and it can be actually transformed into a medicine. And I mean, ultimately it's not for us, right? It's actually for, for our children, for our communities, for the ones who then we encounter, who we have of this medicine that we've made for ourselves and that has helped heal us, but that we can now offer it to others as well. And, um, you know, everybody experiences grief. If you're human, even, even non-human beings, you know, wolves and bears and horses and, um, other creatures actually definitely experience grief too. So it's maybe a mammalian thing, but we all experience grief and, it can seem like, you know, when we look out in the world, especially if we're looking at social media, you know, we see everyone's kind of like highlight reel of their life and, and, uh, you know, even, you know, passing people in the grocery store and interacting on the superficial level in our, in our communities, it can seem like other people are doing great, doing maybe better than us doing fine. Um, but when we really, when we really get down to it, what I find is that almost everyone that we meet has, grief in some form or another. And a lot of times people are not aware of it and haven't touched into it, which is also why a lot of people aren't great at like holding space for our grief when we experience a major loss and are then like in that place of deep suffering. Um, you know, if people haven't done their done their own work and learned how to hold their own grief, then they certainly are not going to be capable of holding it for us. Um, and so that is often the case that people are not even aware that that they have grief or, you know, unprocessed trauma in their being. Um, But if you're a human on the planet at this time, like just especially with what's happening in the world, you know, the increasing amount of suffering every day right now. Yeah. Everybody has grief on some level. And so when we can really grok that and like understand it and, and be with that and especially be with that with the support of a community of people who are, yeah, understanding that together and, and and being together and allowing it to be the work that actually feeds their soul. There's something really beautiful and generative and life-changing that comes out of that. So yeah, so that's, that's all I'm going to say about that for now, but I uh, really want to invite you to check out the winter solstice grief and gratitude releasing ritual that's happening just in a couple days. And if you miss that, and even if you do make it to that, I also want to invite you to the, it's called No Way But Through the sessions that are happening in, in January. And if you're not on my newsletter yet, definitely get on my newsletter, go to darkwoodsofgrief.com and you can sign up on that page. And if you're on that newsletter, then you will be getting emails about both of these events. And if you want to just find out directly about the events, just shoot me an email, info at darkwoodsofgrief.com and I will send you information. So, all right. So we're going to get into the heart of what I want to share with you today now. So I want to start us off with a poem by one of my favorite poets, Mary Oliver. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have learned in my lifetime leads back to this. The fires and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things to love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. So this Mary Oliver in the Blackwater Woods poem, I think so deeply articulates what is being asked of us in this season. 
And unfortunately, you know, we live in a death phobic and a grief phobic culture. And so when we're coming to the bottom of the valley of the year, winter solstice time, unfortunately, you know, this, this colonized way of doing things of, you know, rushing and pressure and, you know, find the right thing and make sure it's perfect. And it's a lot, it's a lot. So there's this, this busyness, you know, and this pressure to, you know, be doing all these things and accomplishing all these things still, you know, still, even in this darkest, you know, what's supposed to be according to nature, if we were following nature, slowest, you know, deepest time of year where there's a lot, there should be rest and rejuvenation happening and a going underground happening in the, in our being, in our psyche, when this should be happening, there's actually this increase that's perpetuated by the colonial culture of, of busyness and rush and hurry and strive and buy and consume and this energy. But there's also then this added layer of the dynamic of what we're missing in terms of family and community. And I want to I want to share with you a story of something I recently experienced. I have a friend who her family is from Gaza, and um, she's been sending us updates from her her family who's there and. We've particularly been following apart her cousins who have uh, three three children and they're a couple, Mahmoud and Fazia, and they're three beautiful children, Mohammed, uh, Maria, and Ahmed. Uh, Ahmed, who's seven years old and sends us videos when they can, when they have access to internet. And actually we haven't heard from them for many days. And so my heart is breaking around the possibility that they may not be alive still because of what is happening there. But I had a huge realization because I was suggesting to them, you know, they were saying, yeah, we may have to give up and, and try to get to Egypt. And, and, um, and I said, yeah, like my intuition is saying that's good to go, you know, to survive, to get out of there. And I want to share this story with you because it really relates to what we've lost in the West in terms of family and community. Because a few days later, uh, my friend sent us, the, the, she said, oh, the, the cousins, they, they're all, you know, living at the UN center uh, in South Gaza now, and, you know, just outside, it was barely no food and water or very hard access to food and water. But she said, oh, one of the cousins, uh, got the family together to take a photo to send us. And she sent us this photo. And this photo has like, there's like 30 people in this photo. And it just blew me away because I realized that the idea of family that we have in the West is so much different than what family was and is in the in the old world, you know, in in Palestine, in many of the the countries where you know people have lived for a long time, where my ancestors come from, also in indigenous uh, communities here in Turtle Island, family is the extended family is huge, right? The extended family is community, and and she also told me, my friend, she said that they had there was a few years ago they were, her and her husband were trying to adopt a child from Palestine because they would have meant a lot for them to be able to adopt a child of, you know, an orphan of someone who, you know, people are being killed there all the time by the Israeli army. And, and, and I mean, of course, people die of natural causes too. And so there's orphans and, but what they found is that they could not adopt a child from Palestine because always, always, always when a child becomes orphan, they get taken in by the family that is there by the extended family. And if not the extended family, by the, you know, the friends, the community, because their idea of family there is so strong that nobody is ever alone. Nobody is ever orphaned. There's always somebody to take them in. And I mean, for one thing, how devastating that that 
that culture and that those families and those communities are being destroyed right now. But for the purpose of our, our, this podcast, this understanding that like in the West, because we are so, uh, our families have become so much smaller and more like the nuclear family is what we're familiar with here. We've, we've lost that sense of big extended family for the most part. I know, I do know people who have it to some, to some degree, but it means that when we have, when our family becomes so small and when we have no community, you know, we have no village, when we lose the people closest to us, then we have nobody. And there's so many people, probably many of you who are listening out there today who are in that situation where you have nobody. And so we need to recognize that when we're in a time a ho- you know, a holiday time that I think this time of year, you know, Christmas, solstice, the season, Hanukkah, um, you know, all the different Diwali, all the different, you know, um, traditions that happen this time of year are based around family and community. There's a family and community traditions. And when we don't have family and community and we're faced with all of these traditions and celebrations and you know many people coming together in that way it brings us into what francis weller calls what we expected and did not receive the third gate of grief it brings us deeply into that gate of grief uh, and uh, and that feeling of aloneness and isolation and if on top of that we're also grieving a major loss then it can be just unbearable to be trying to navigate this time this is a really really big problem this sense of isolation that we can feel in our in this society today that is perpetuated by the society of individualism you know me and mine and and so a lot of people end up really really lonely at this time of year and that is compounded by the fact that this is the season when our grief and our it can come the most forward, right? Because because of the darker days, because of the you know the descent into the winter energy, I think that it's really important to first recognize that that's the context that we're living in is this context of um, separation culture, you know, um, individuality culture, me, mine, you know, this colonial culture that and. So this sense of lack of support, of loneliness, of aloneness is is there. And so it's really important that if we're experiencing isolation in that way, that, you know, we we recognize where that's coming from, right? You know, like it's not your fault if you're feeling that way. Um, and if that's your experience, you know, it is a, it is a, a cultural, a societal issue, and that said, you know, there is a, uh, also <laughs> both, right? There is also a place where if we want that to shift, we, we have to take responsibility for this, our situation, you know, our individual situation and do what we can to, uh, to remedy that problem, which is the problem of isolation and aloneness. And so, you know, looking for community, looking for places where, you can come in and be a part of connection, you know, be, be held. And, and I will say that, I mean, those spaces are hard to find, which is why I do what I do, why I offer, um, um, you know, a community for people to come into and be with their grief, because I think those places are really hard to find. And ideally we would all have them in our own, in, you know, close to our own home where we could go and be in person in those places. Um, but the reality is that that's, that's, not the case oftentimes. Yeah. So just to recognize that, to recognize that it is a need. And so, yeah, just to, you know, normalize the experience and also um, offer, you know, some medicine for it. The next thing I want to talk about is depression and grief and um, differentiating between the two. So we're going to differentiate between the two, and then we're going to talk about how we can support both of those. Martin Paractel says depression is not grief. He says depression is stuck. Grief 
fuck, it's not moving. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not the energy moving and grieving. It's stuck, right? It's unprocessed stuck grief. And so, so the two are not the same thing. And, and I think it's really important to recognize that when we don't have the support and the tools and the skills of how to work with our grief, it can very easily become stuck grief and become depression, right? And ask me how I know. <laughs> when I was a young person, 19, I went through a year of some very, very severe uh, clinical depression. I know for sure now that it was, it was related. It was chemically related to uh, birth control pills that I was taking at the time. And birth control pills are widely known to have a side effect of uh, chemical depression in the brain. And so once I got off of those pills, I improved a lot. I shouldn't say I improved a lot. That makes it sound like it's <laughs> like getting out of depression is self-improvement, which, but my, you know, my brain stayed balanced out basically. And I was able to start to um, move the energy in a better way. When I was on those pills, it was practically impossible to, even though I had quite a few tools at that point already in my, my healing toolkit, it was it was just such a chemical state. And I do know that this, this can happen to people. You know, we, we develop neural pathways when we spend too much time isolated in our grief, those neural pathways get um, developed that can actually lead us into that stuckness and into that, you know, deep chemical depression. And so it can take a lot of work and a lot of support to get us out of that. And sometimes I think there is a place for medication, you know, antidepressant medication to support, to help, like get those neural pathways moving in a different direction. That said, I think we can really easily, if we don't address the root cause, get stuck on um, on medication and get stuck in in like a, a state where we're actually not feeling. It's just like a plateau, right? And some kind of a sense of flatness. And when we start to be able to actually move that energy um, and and touch into our grief and allow it to move, then we start to have a more full range of emotions, not just deep sorrow or rage or, you know, those hard feelings, but we also get more access to joy and connection. Um, and so, so that's one of the reasons why this work is really, really important because yes, we can, you know, we can help ourselves and be helped to some degree, I think with, um, with medication, with nutrition, um, these type of things, but we ultimately need to address uh, the root cause. And so, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about though, like what are some things other than medication that we can use to help start getting that energy moving and those neural pathways shifting? Um, because I think that if you do experience depression and you're in the Northern hemisphere, these dark days of winter and especially the solstice time and especially compounded with the layers of holidays and, you know, you're supposed to feel joyful and great can really, really, really compound the energy and feelings of depression. And I hear from a lot of people who are experiencing um, suicidal thoughts this time of year because of that. So I know that it can be really, really painful. And particularly also if you've had a, a major loss in the last year or few years, um, it can be a really, really hard time. And so, so some of these things that I'm going to share um, are helpful, I think, both for grieving as well as for um, starting to move that energy of, of depression. And one more thing, actually, I want to say about depression is that when it gets to, you know, it's it, depression is really like, it, when we look at it in terms of nervous system, it's really, um, it's really related to uh, f the freeze response and to a, like a shutting down a, um, a hypo, so, you know, a hypo, um, active nervous system. So it's like an under, an under active nervous system. We're like, you know, too low. Right. Um, and so one of the reasons for, you know, especially if you're starting to, if we start to experience suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideation, um, something that I think is really helpful for people to know and understand is that when we have a, traumatic experience 
one of the responses is to is freeze and shut down, right? And that freeze shut down um, response, it's like um, the way that possums play dead, right? When they think they're going to be eaten, right? And so it's it's literally our animal nervous system is like shutting down and, uh, and all these um, analgesic, you know, painkiller neurochemicals start to run through the nervous system. And that is protective of our being so that if we literally are going to be killed or eaten, that we don't feel the pain of that as intensely. Right. So it's like our body is preparing for death when we start to touch into that freeze response. Right. And so when we touch that freeze response later in our lives, if we haven't moved that trauma energy through and come out of that freeze response, you know, part of our nervous system can be be stuck in that freeze. And then when we touch that, that freeze energy in our nervous system, even if it's in a healing way, like we're, we're starting to touch it and we're starting to like move it a little bit, it's very normal to start to feel um, suicidal thoughts because we're touching an energy that was preparing for death. So it's literally like our body, mind, spirit had prepared for death. And when we touch that, our body, mind, spirit is like, oh yeah, I'm ready to die. Right. And so if we can touch that place with awareness of recognizing, like when we have those thoughts, right. Like maybe I should die. Maybe I want to die. How could I die? You know, creating all the ways that actually those thoughts actually may be coming from an energy that's just trying to move. That's trying to come out of that freeze response. Right. And so when we know that, then we can start to go like, Oh, okay. That thought means that I need to actually like help my body come out of freeze ways that we can help our body come out of freeze, wiggling the fingers and toes. Okay wiggling the fingers and toes, getting the body moving, even if it's that subtle, uh, putting on some music and just starting to move the body, you know, even a little bit, even if you like can't get out of bed, put on music and like wiggle the fingers and toes, move the body, see if you can let the music move the body, keep recognizing, you know, what's happening in the body, right? Which is that freeze response, see it, witness it and uh, invite it to start to move. Right. And I do really recommend getting support with this. Like this is definitely, if you're working with the energy on that level, working with a somatic therapist, working with someone who can actually like help you move through that is really, really good because a lot of times we think like, oh, well, I should, you know, if I have these tools, if I have this understanding, I should be able to do it on my own. But that is the colonial mindset again, coming through or this idea of individuality that we should be able to like be strong and do things by ourselves. We're not meant to move through this kind of energy, this kind of trauma, this kind of healing by ourselves. We're actually meant to be in a whole group of people, a whole community, a whole um, a whole bunch of support, right? So, so like, it's almost like the minimum is getting one other person there to help and support you. And, um, and I think one-on-one therapy can be really, really helpful in this way. Um, being in ritual, being in community space um, is probably the best medicine for it, but sometimes doing one-on-one therapy for a period of time before coming into a ritual space is actually helpful because we build the capacity of our nervous system um, then to be able to come into the stronger energy of the ritual space. So, um, yeah. So recognizing that freeze response, that shutdown, that depression is probably coming from unprocessed grief and trauma, right? This is major, major important. Now, other ways of getting that energy moving, right? Because grief energy needs to move. It needs to move. Um, and so other ways are, um, starting to learn to feel our body, right? So, so gaining somatic skills, which, uh, you know, these are, these are things that I do teach in the Through the Dark Woods online community and skills you can also get by working with a somatic therapist. So gaining those somatic skills, learning how to feel the body because grief lives in our body and we need to move it through the body, right? Okay. Um, I talked about wiggling the fingers and toes, you know, maybe using music to get the body moving is really, really helpful. Uh, learning to feel the body and get the energy moving in the body. And and I'm going to name a bunch of things and like these things, not everything is going to work for everybody, right? Some, but like if, even if you can choose one or two of these tools and get them working for you, that's great because not everything is going to work for everybody. 
Um, and what's going to work for one person is not going to work for another person and vice versa. Right. So, um, so that's why I'm going to try to give you a variety of, of tools. So um, meditation can be really, really helpful for some people. And I want to explain what I mean when I say meditation, because um, a lot of people think that meditating is like having no thoughts in your mind and, um, <laughs> or like focusing on something and keeping that focus. And the way that I uh, teach meditation comes from my teacher, Elizabeth Claire Burr, uh, and the lineage of Mingar Rinpoche, uh, incredible Tibetan teacher who has spent a lot of time in the West and brought his teachings here. So the way, the way that we teach is actually uh, open, open awareness or uh, non-meditation. <laughs> and it's really uh, building the witness part of ourself, right? So we sit and if we have a thought, you know, if we catch ourselves thinking, if we catch ourselves thought spiraling way down <laughs> the uh, thought spiral, we just bring it back, right? And we keep, we notice and we bring it back. We notice and we bring it back. And the awareness is noticing what's happening in the body, noticing what's happening around us in the space, noticing sound, noticing, um, just noticing, observing, witnessing, right? So really building that inner witness. And I think that this can be really, really helpful practice. And again, this is something that we teach in the Through the Dark Woods membership community. Elizabeth actually teaches uh, in that community on Monday evenings. Uh, another really powerful practice is cold water immersion. And again, this is not going to work for everybody. You know, some people are going to be like, I cannot do that. But, um, you know, I was sharing with uh, one of my students the other day whose friend is struggling with um, feeling suicidal. Cold water immersion is cool, <laughs> no pun intended, but it's it's really cool because it actually kind of feels like self-harm, you know? So if you're like really in that place where you're like, yeah, I want to experience, um, I want to harm myself, like I want to die, getting in the cold water actually feels a bit like that, you know? It's like, it can feel like death, it can feel like self-harm and the magic of it is, is that getting in the cold water and staying there for one to two minutes actually produces more dopamine in the brain than uh, snorting cocaine. And it lasts for like way longer. <laughs> so um, this is a, a, a really natural, really um, purifying, healing way of actually giving your brain more dopamine while also, you know, um, kind of feeding that part of yourself that is like, oh, I want to feel something intense, right? Um, so it helps us, I think it helps us get into our bodies also. So cold water immersion. Um, and if you have the facility, the facilities alternating cold water immersion with sauna is really amazing. So highly recommend that. Yeah. And I think getting in wild water is ideal, but definitely if you have a cold water pool or just, you know, turning your shower to cold um, back and forth from cold to hot in the shower in the morning or, you know, throughout the day, it can be really great um, as well. Definitely better than nothing. So, um, yeah. And then the last thing that I want to mention, and of course there's, you know, there's so many more tools, but this is just, you know, just trying to give you a few for today is, unplugging from the internet, unplugging from Facebook, unplugging from Instagram, you know, definitely not doom scrolling, right? That doom scrolling is so it's proven actually to create depression and to create um, suicidal thoughts when we do it too much. Um, it's not good for the brain. It's not good for the spirit. And um, actually Ryan Gordon, uh, I saw a beautiful piece that she'd written a couple days ago about uh, actually sometimes we actually need to not just step away from it and maybe like delete those apps from our phone, which are good things to do if you're finding yourself doom scrolling a lot, but actually um, cutting cords from Instagram, cutting cords from Facebook, cutting cords from, you know, Netflix or whatever it is. And literally you can just go through the body and, you know, um, uh, pretend that your hand is like a knife or scissors. And you literally like cut cords 
feel into where they are and cut them. And if you're struggling to do this, then, you know, get support. This is something that I offer. This is something Ran offers. Um, and yeah, shamanic cord cutting, very, very powerful process and a good thing to learn to know how to do so that you can do it multiple times a day. If you're struggling with, uh, an addiction like this, you know, to uh, really an addiction to anything, not just social media or the internet, but anything we can cut cords, um, and clear and, um, and yeah, getting in cold water is actually a beautiful and powerful way to cut cords as well. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So I think those are the main things I wanted to talk about in regards to depression and grief. And now I want to actually read you this beautiful piece that, uh, relationship enhancement specialist, uh, Shinuka Mayoshi Smith wrote, uh, she calls this holiday host etiquette. So this is for I think this is really, I'm just going to frame it a little bit more before I read it. I think this is really good to understand if you're somebody who is holding, has, you know, holding other people who has other people in your lives who have experienced major loss recently, um, or who are, you know, struggling with depression or, you know, have experienced major loss, not so recently, but are still struggling with it because that certainly can be the case as well. And it's also good to know as a griever, you know, someone who's grieving because, when we are really clear about what we need, then sometimes it can help us to actually be able to articulate it and ask for what we need, which is really important skill when you're grieving to be able to ask really clearly from the people around you for what you need, because most cases people are not naturally great at, or I shouldn't say naturally, but we just don't learn these skills, right? So holiday host aesthetic, but if you're inviting someone to your home and they're grieving, be sure you're inviting their grief to attend to it will be there anyway. Don't invite someone with the goal of cheering them up for the holidays. Don't expect them to put on a happy face in your home. Don't demand they fake it until they make it or do something they don't want to do either. Inviting them with the loving intention of offering cheer and companionship and unconditional care during the holidays. To do this, you'll need to honor and be responsive to their needs and emotions. You can do this by privately acknowledging their grief when you make the invitation. I know this season is extra hard and your heart is hurting. You and your grief are welcome in our home. Come as you are. We'd be honored to have you with us. It's also incredibly loving to honor the reality that it's often hard for grieving folks to know what they will want, need, be up for, or be able to tolerate at the holidays. So giving them a need without the, uh, sorry, giving them an invite without the need for commitment and permission to change their mind is extra loving. You don't have to decide right now. You could say, if it feels good to be with us, we have plenty of food and love for you. Just show up. I'll check in again the day before to see if you're feeling up to coming over. And if there's anything you'd like me to know about how we can support you. Your grieving friends and fam need attentive care and responsiveness at the holidays, not plans to keep them busy, distracted, and happy. If they're laughing, laugh with them. If they're weeping, ask if they'd like your company or your help finding a quiet place to snuggle up alone for a while. If they're laughing while weeping, this is more common than you'd think. Stay with them. This is a precious moment of the human experience that is truly sacred. We don't need to protect ourselves or each other from grief at the holidays. In fact, the more we embrace grief as an honored holiday guest, the more healthy, happy, and whole our holidays will be. That is so beautiful. And again, that's Shaniqua Mayoshi Smith. And I want to read another piece from my friend on Dancing Otter. Because I think this, you know, claiming this, what she says here, claiming this for ourselves at this time through the holidays is, is so, so important. Um, so she says, you do not need to audition your grief. You do not have to find an equally joyful statement to sweeten the astringency of I'm sad or I'm hurting or I feel lost. You are not required to provide digestive enzymes for others to metabolize your lived experience. You are not tasked with saving others from the discomfort or perceived inconvenience that they experience in witnessing your authentic feelings. It is a gift you bring to take space, to look back on where you've walked, to tell those stories. It is a privilege for others to listen to you sharing your truth. So again, that's Don Dancing Otter. And 
yeah, I think this is so important to own this for ourselves because when we can own it for ourselves, we can also give other people permission to not try to fix us, right? And often often that is what we need to do in the society, unfortunately, you know, especially when dealing with, you know, family and friends that may not have the understanding of grief that that we have. Um so often we may need to say like, hey, I actually just, you know, just need to express exactly where I'm at. Be with what it is. I don't need you to fix me or help me or try to cheer me up, right? If we can just, if we can just ask for that and and invite other people to hold us in that way, sometimes that's all the permission that they need to be able to just be with us. And we will also learn through this process of asking for what we need and, you know, being in our grief, we will also learn who who is around us that can do that, right? I, I mean, so many times I've heard, I hear that when we experience a major loss, when someone experiences a major loss, the people in their lives like just disappear, right? The people who they thought were their friends, who they thought were there from them, for them are not able to tolerate it, are not able to hold it, to handle it, right? And so I think that that can also um, inhibit us from expressing our grief but wouldn't you rather be authentic and find out who can show up for you authentically than suppress your authentic experience, right? And sometimes we have to have a complete uh, transformation and renewal in our friend groups in who is around us when we go through an initiation, like a major loss in our lives because it does uh, it does bring us into a reckoning with authenticity and with who can handle authenticity. And so don't make yourself wrong if you're surrounded by people who don't seem to be able to handle your experience, right? Don't make yourself wrong. Instead, recognize that it's probably their stuff that's, you know, their own unprocessed grief that's getting in the way that they haven't worked with and find people who can hold your experience right? Because your experience is so worthy of being held, of being heard, of being seen, of being witnessed, of being with. And it's only through being witnessed and being held and being seen that we develop the capacity, that we broaden our capacity to be able to be with our own experience, right? So we do need, we do need people and there is people out there who can, who can be with your experience. So I really, really want to invite invite that. And um, yeah, if you are struggling to find people around you who can hold you through your experience, then definitely come and check out our Through the Dark Woods community. Definitely consider coming and joining us for our winter solstice ritual. Uh, I would love to love to see you there and, um, and hear your story and get to know you a little bit more and support you with these skills, with these tools, and just with the space to come where everything's welcome. So I think that's all that I'm going to share for today. I hope that some of what I've shared has been helpful and wishing you a really beautiful, blessed holiday uh, season, solstice season, you know, this, this dark time can be a beautiful time. The darkness does not have to be a time and a place that we fear. There's so much richness that comes from being in the dark. It's the dark soil that seeds uh, begin their, their growth within. Yeah. I'm going to leave you today with a poem, a piece of writing by Bridget Anna McNeil. She says, in the dark and invisible world, life thrums. Deep under the earth, the seeds covered and fed by all that has been let go of, all that has been given up in offering are held, forming, rooting, opening, and shaping. Within the blackened, transformant matter, life begins. In the death of the old, medicine is born. All beginnings start in the darkness, in the fecund earth, 
in the pulsing womb. It is not spring where life suddenly appears out of nowhere, but now in these inward months. Spring is not a savior of winter days. It is birthed from winter, born because of winter. And it is this winter story that teaches me much about my own human journey. All right, blessings. I hope to see you at our winter solstice releasing ritual. And uh, may the dark nourish you, body, mind, spirit, and soul. May you rest and be blessed by the rest of this season, by the calling down the gravity that pulls us towards the earth, the darkness in the night, in these long nights that nourishes our dreams and brings us into a place of readiness for what will come when the sun rises.